Richard Serrett's Strange Planet, following the truth wherever it leads, exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites, revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality, coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard. Welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Come on in, weary traveler. Hang your cloak on a peg, grab a stool, and come gather around the fire. There are stories to be told, and you are among friends. Carlos Cagina is our technical producer, and Ryan White is the live stream producer. Please check out my YouTube and Rumble channels, Strange Planet. Well, my guest tonight for the full two hours, no stranger to this program, and he believes that the UFO phenomenon is the empirical evidence for the existence of angels, both good and bad. In fact, he believes the sudden massive appearance of UFOs, which really began in earnest 75 years ago in June of this year, that mass appearance of UFOs in 1947 is of prophetic importance. Ali Siadatan is a documentary filmmaker, an expert in the arena of biblical prophecy. He's, he's also the creator of the production company Think Again Productions. Thinkagainproductions.com, the website and the documentary UFOs, Angels, and Gods. Ali, welcome back. How are you, my friend? Um, great. Thank you for having me, Richard. So June 1975. Before Roswell, there was Kenneth Arnold, pilot businessman, flying near Mount Rainier in uh, the Pacific Northwest in Washington State, looks out his cockpit window and sees these flying discs. He, uh, dis he uh, described them as kind of saucer-shaped, and uh, the name stuck forevermore, flying saucers. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. What, what is the relationship between the UFO phenomena, which began in 1947, and the end of days? Um, well, yeah, I think that, that 1947, that's a very important date. Like, with hindsight, the prophets of Israel painted a picture that one day God would call uh, his people back to this promised land, and instead of certain things would happen to them. Uh, that would eventually culminate with the coming of the Messiah and the establishing of the new age of history. And these things have never happened in the recorded history of Israel. Uh, and so suddenly, you know, as the events of history that most people are familiar with, with the Holocaust and, and the birth of uh, Jewish and Christian Zionism, there, it all culminates uh, in 1947, in November, when the United Nations declares um, Israel a new nation, a nation that literally didn't exist the day before and exist the next day. There's a prophecy, in fact, in the Bible that talks about this nation that is suddenly born overnight. It's in Isaiah 66. And that's 1947. It kickstarts the birth pang years, this period of history um, that is going to lead and culminate in the second coming uh, of Jesus Christ, which is uh, itself kind of a galactic event, you know, where He's called the, the, the God of Heaven's Armies. That's one of the titles of God. And so there's a whole legion of, of, of angels, you know, coming. Um, and there's interesting descriptions of all of this. This is the culmination. And so the, the birth of the nation of Israel puts us into this period of history. And it just so happens that it was on this year, like you mentioned with Kenneth Arnold in 1947, that where suddenly we see uh, the appearance of the UFOs. Uh, well, Kenneth Arnold, uh, people can listen to his radio interview given around that time, uh, to his testimony, what he sees, uh, it's, it's great detail. He measures the speed at which, you know, over a thousand miles an hour, these things are moving from peak to peak. And then on, on the strength of his testimony, because he's a very respectable man, tens of thousands of Americans come out, um, from there, it's like a, a, an avalanche where, you know, you have the Roswell incident the next month, and then you have um, uh, other incidences in, in, in 1948 
that kind of cement the fact that, wow, we're being visited by aliens, it seems. Right, it's the right. beginning of what's called the UFO flap. And, and yeah, so I mean, people think of, okay, there was Kenneth Arnold and there was Roswell, and in 48, there was like the Aztec UFO uh, crash. But in 47, I mean, there were, there were hundreds, hundreds of UFO sightings. It wasn't just Kenneth Arnold and Roswell. It was, yeah. as you say, it was like a flap. Yeah, it was a. It was, that's that's where the word was invented, you know. That and all these people came out uh, to say, "Hey, we're seeing this stuff too." I mean, Kenneth Arnold's testimony was on the front page of half of the national newspaper publications, um, and that's what really got everyone's attention. Um, and it's as though a sign was given on the earth that Israel was born, and a sign was given in the heavens. These things appeared. And these are kind of the beginnings of a puzzle, you know, that we need to now understand why, why is this happening at this time? And what does it really mean? You know, uh, right. so what's the connection between the birth yeah. of the modern state of Israel and the, uh, the, the beginning of the modern day UFO phenomena? Because, you know, people have commented before about this, that in, in 47, it was almost as if something opened up some portal or some opening um, that, that, that caused this rush of, of UFOs into our reality. So it, it begs the question as to whether there was, you know, something on this side of the veil, if you will, that, that caused yeah. this, that willed this to happen something perhaps occult is there a connection between the beginning of the modern day ufo phenomenon and the occult i think so um first of all where kenneth arnold saw this uh as it was on the cascade mountains in washington state like you mentioned but as where's the cascade mountains well there's mount shasta which is right there and there's lots of very occult activity at the foot of Mount Shasta, it's it was a place, a sacred place for the Native Americans, and it continued to be a sacred place. And and so there, there's it's interesting that it was around there that this happened. And before that, in 1946, there's a very strange uh, character um, and kind of a genius in some ways. His name is Jack Parson, mm. and so Jack Parson is a rocket engineer. He's many people consider him to be the the father of the rocket age. He, he yeah. created the solid fuel that allowed us to send, you know, rockets uh, to the moon. Um, but what's self taught, apparently. I don't, I, I think he was self taught, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he was self taught. And he, he was also an occultist. And he said that it was during the rituals that the idea came to him. Yeah, he was a devotee Where, of Aleister Crowley. But yeah, he, he, he had these very nefarious connections. He was a student of Astro Crowley, and he was also uh, lived in the same house with L. Ron Hubbard. Um, this is, you know, once he, he created a company where they're selling technology to the military, and he became wealthy, and he bought a mansion, and L. Ron Hubbard moved into that mansion with him. Uh -huh. Then him and Hubbard went, you know, some, in Southern California to a place that's called the Devil's Gate, and they began to perform these rituals there in 1946, like between January and March of 1946. And the, this, they called it the Babylon working. That was the name of, of their ritual. It was based on teachings of Aris, Al, uh, Alistair Crowley. And the purpose of it um, uh, was to, the ritual was essentially designed to manifest an individual incarnation of the archetypical divine feminine called Bab Alon. It's, it was part of an occult society, Thelma, that they had created. And what's interesting is that the word Bab means gate, actually. That's why you have Babylon, right? In, in, in the Mesopotamian language, Iloni means gods. Babyloni means the gateway to the gods. And so the, this is interesting that even though this was some sort of a mother goddess or but it is, it has the term gate in it. And if you kind of look at uh, the, the writings of like Necronomicon, I'm not suggesting that anyone should open that book. I really, should, I really am not suggesting it. 
but you know, I'm, I'm a researcher and so I have to look into things and to understand them. Um, you look at that, the Alistair Crowley's writings, they all hail back to the ancient Mesopotamian gods. There's tons of tons of um, songs and songs to the queen of heaven and to other gods of Mesopotamia and all kinds of symbols that he has, which are uh, gates that you open to summon these beings. Because it's interesting, this idea that Al Alistair Crowley, con Crowley connected to the sons of God, uh, which, to these deities of, of ancient Mesopotamia that were, according to the Bible, bound and chained um, and, and put aside. Uh, this is the story that is, you know, in, in the Book of Enoch. This is a story that, that we see in the writings of Peter and Jude in the New Testament. And so suddenly, they're studying with this guy who has a connection to, to all of this. And then they start to perform these rituals in 1946. And boom, in 1947, we start to see the beginning of this. Um, so definitely, there was actually a, a group of Christian uh, politicians in the United States that looked into it, uh, into the beginning of the UFO phenomenon. And they came to the conclusion that these guys had opened the gate. That was their official conclusion. Right, right. Yes. It's interesting also, Jack Parsons, people are familiar with uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL. Some speculate that JPL actually stood for Jack Parsons, not Jet it's Propulsion. It's possible because he created that company. Yes. And then, of course, he's, he's uh, killed in a fiery explosion Yes. Uh, after he performs this ritual. Yes. So there's he's no he's not there anymore to to uh i mean the second part of the ritual i believe is to bind to bind whatever entity uh the he was trying to summon an entity that's how he died yeah. um and uh, the jet propulsion laboratory is built on the site of these experiments of these occult experiments it's built at on the site of the devil's gate and to this day, people say it's a hotbed of UFO activity. So it's like, wow, the, was there an occult inspiration, you know, into NASA? And because he said that these ideas came to him about the jet fuel during that ritual. Um, so there's the, the Mount Shasta where, where we see this. Uh, the first time there is the Jack Parson and his occult connection. Um, I find it interesting that the first object in space, Sputnik, uh, sent by the Soviet Union. Um, I was um, looking into the date of when it was sent, and I had this idea to look it up in the Hebrew calendar, in the, in the biblical calendar, and it fell on the Day of Atonement. It was, Sputnik was sent into space on the Day of Atonement. Now, in, in the biblical calendar, the Day of Atonement is also the Day of Judgment. It has a double meaning. The, it's the redeemed, uh, there are those who are redeemed and those who are judged. That's it. It does both. And so if you're atoned for, then you know, you're forgiven. That's that's the judgment you receive. It's forgiveness. But if you're not atoned for, then you're judged. And so it's, it has a double meaning. So it's, it reminded me of this idea of reaching into the heavens, like the story of Nimrod that brought about a judgment. So there was this attempt to reach into the heavens. And Sputnik has that kind of a feeling. So even though we can look at it from just humanity's natural, you know, exploration, uh, which is also part of all of this. Not everyone is in the occult who's involved, like in the space program. But even you look at CERN, for instance, the gate, um, uh, the particle accelerator, uh, I should say. And you look at the video of, uh, when CERN was inaugurated, there's a huge amount of weird occult, you know, rituals happening at the beginning uh, of the inauguration of CERN, if, if you watch the video, I mean, it's, 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 it's weird. Yeah, people dressed as um, goats and Baphomet and, and... Yeah, yeah. And then when you go in, the, in CERN, there is um, little um, flags hanging from the ceiling with scriptures in Sanskrit and from the Bhagavad Gita and the, and the writings of the gods. and. And the whole thing has the marks of the gods, and we can get into that later, like the Apollo mission. Um, what is this uh, new uh, treatise that Trump signed? It was, it's not the Andromeda. It's, uh, the Abraham Accords? No, 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 not with the... Not with the uh, Trump brought in a space treaty. Oh, to, 
yeah. the Space so, Force. It, to allow uh, all, all the nations to collaborate with the United States to further the exploration of space. Um, and it has a name. Uh, I can look it up as we're talking. It's called, it's not Andromeda. It's, um, uh, I have to look it up. It's Apollo's sister. So it's interesting that you have the Apollo missions, and then you have a sister, which has the name of this treaty, and they're both the children of Zeus. And so there, why, why, what is the significance of this, you know, Greek? Artemis? Artemis, the Artemis Accords. So you have the Artemis Accords and the Apollo missions, both children of Zeus. Um, now, who is Zeus? What, what's, why is there the handprint of these things? So there's a lot of, you know, occult associated all around this. And when you kind of consider that in the biblical view, there are three heavens. The first heaven is the sky where the birds fly. The second heaven is where the sun, moon, and stars exist that we call the universe. And the third heaven is the temple at the heart of time and space where the letter uh, to the book of Hebrews says that the Messiah ascended in the temple. And that is at the heart of time and space. And so there's that's called the third heaven in the Bible. That's why the word heaven is plural in the Bible, shamayim, which means in English is translated as heavens because it's actually plural in Hebrew. So when you think that, wait a second, are we really going into space or are we reaching into the heavens, into mm. the second heaven? And that's why I'm saying this has this, you know, the, the Sputnik and the Day of Atonement. It sounds like Nimrod, you know, reaching into the heavens. Right. And it's also a day of judgment. So that hubris, that hubris, hubris of man hubris. trying to reach into, you know, God's domain. Yes. And, will, and perhaps will with a judgment will come with a judgment. Well, perhaps because it's, it's like Jack Parsons, these gates, perhaps because behind this is ideas, knowledge and technology coming from the fallen angels because they're, they, they have, they're using it. They have their own ambition. They're preparing for the great war of angels that's ahead of us. Okay, so let's just, um, a quick summary here. So the birth of Israel, 1947, it's announced. I guess it becomes formally, it declares itself a state in 48, but the UN proclamation, if you will, comes yeah. about in 47. That parallels with the... Appearing Kenneth, of the signs in the heavens. Yes, and the Kenneth Arnold, the modern-day UFO phenomenon. Which, and then if we back up, the question is, was that UFO flap a result of Jack Parsons, of JPL, Parsons. utilizing, you know, Aleister Crowley's... Um, gate opening rituals. Gate opening rituals that allowed these entities to come the through yeah, the, the, into the, our reality. Well, so because when, when you kind of start to to, because when you kind of follow the UFO phenomenon and you go, where does it lead to? Well, it leads to, uh, the research shows that it leads to alien abductions and the creation of hybrids. Okay, so let's talk specifically then about what, we've got about uh, three minutes here, two minutes, okay. that came through that that portal that Jack Parsons opened up. Well, what came through is known by their actions. The, like the Lord said, you'll know the fruits, uh, the tree by its fruits. So the actions is they began a massive program of creating hybrids, and that's what the top researchers like Johnny Mack from Harvard, David Jacobs from Temple University, these guys discovered that's what's going on. And that is very important because when you kind of look at the biblical account, you go, where have we seen these Hari hybrids before? Well, it takes us to the days before the flood, to the days of the sons of God and the Nephilim. That's the biblical term for these hybrids. And it said that it would happen then and afterwards. And then when Jesus was asked to talk about the end of the age, he said it would be like the days of Noah. So, so the end of this age will be again, because you see in the Hebrew mind, all of these historical stories in the Bible, they were there because they are samples of future ages. So they are future events have been played out in small and, and they've been recorded in the Bible. And each of the historical accounts of the Bible is an age that is pregnant with, 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 the, history, with the story of a future age. And so this, when he says, oh, this was like the days of Noah, he's pulling out that chapter from the book of Genesis and saying, look, the end of this age will be like that. If you want to understand this, understand that. So they ushered us into this. As I'm saying, a sign was given on the earth 
prophetically, and it seems that a sign was given in the heavens, we entered a new age of history that Jesus calls the days of Noah. All right, all right, we're going to roll into a break here. Ali Siadatan, Think Again Productions, and we'll uh, continue to talk about the connection between the uh, 75th anniversary this year of the modern day UFO phenomenon, its connection, its prophetic uh, importance to the, uh, the second coming of Christ. Back with more in a moment. Stay with us. In times of economic uncertainty and chaos, your money means nothing. You may not even be able to get it from your bank or ATM. And the money you do have in the stock market will go down and down. What you can bank on is gold and silver. Gold and silver have been a reliable and trusted form of currency for thousands of years. Gold and silver have never been worth zero, and typically gold holds its value during economic turmoil. Call the gold hotline now and learn how to protect your money and your assets with gold and silver. And learn how to set up a new IRA or roll over your current one into a gold-backed IRA. Protect your money from the next market crash with gold and silver. Call now for your free gold guide. 800-461-9694. 800-461-9694. That's 800-461-9694. Do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Are you being audited or investigated? Has the IRS sent you a letter demanding payment? You may not owe what they claim. Make this free call to the tax doctor now. Let them negotiate with the IRS on your behalf. 800-626-4512. 800-626-4512. That's 800-626-4512. If you're a diabetic, we have great news. You can end the painful finger sticks with a new CGM. Plus, they may be covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance. If you test and inject daily, you may qualify. Call U.S. Med now to learn more. 800-817-2974. 800-817-2974. 800-817-2974. That's 800-817-2974. As you're staring up at the night sky, ever wonder who's staring back? You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. And we're back with Ali Siadatan, documentary filmmaker, researcher, biblical scholar, thinkagainproductions.com, the website, and you can view his documentary ufos angels and gods uh for free i believe there's a a link on the website there thinkagainproductions.com so we were talking about the entities that came through this portal um i mean it jack parsons uh utilizing the um the rituals of alistair crowley I mean, there may have been others. Would, would that be fair to say that it wasn't just Jack Parsons? It, there may have been others in other locations? Uh, yeah, of course. But it's also possible that uh, the Holy Spirit is pulling this information out for us and saying, look at this guy. Uh, you know, uh, because not a lot of people went that deep. In, you know, how many people were into rocket uh, engineering, into what led to NASA and, and into occult? And when, as I said, once I looked into Alistair Crowley's uh, writings, I was surprised because this was at the end of my research that it, he actually had s- connected to the gods of Mesopotamia. I had no idea. I mean, I knew about him, like, you know, in, in, in this master of the occult, but I never look, looked into it. Once I understood who the gods were and their Mesopotamian importance, then, then when I looked at that, I was like, whoa, this ties into the days of Noah uh, paradigm. Um, do you think Parsons was cognizant? Impossible to know, I guess. But would he have been cognizant that what he was doing um, by opening up this portal mm-hmm. was, I guess I'm kind of jumping ahead here to getting to the motivation here, uh, that, that, that by bringing in these fallen angels through, the, through this portal into our reality, that it would help forestall, that they were attempting to forestall the the um, 
you know, the, 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 the birth of the modern day state of Israel. Was, was Parsons cogniz cognizant of that? Was he working in league with them? Or was he just saying, wow, imagine the power I could have if I could bring these entities, you know, into our reality? No, I don't, I don't think he was cognizant. But the, the idea of preventing the birth of Israel uh, which is something you know the, the the in the New Testament you know the enemies are called vipers and viper is the only snake that eats the eggs of other snakes, and that's one of the marks of this enemy. It tries to nip things in the butt before they flourish, and so in order to have that, we have to roll back to the occult tradition that led to the rise of the Third Reich, uh, with Madame Butzavista and um, all of the spiritualism that poured into Germany that really completely removed Germany from its you know, Christian traditions and took it back to the worship of the gods of old. And eventually they needed a, a guide, a focalizing human being, the Fuhrer they called him, and to bring in the vision. And, and that was what was competing with the birth of Israel, the 1,000 year Reich to compete with the 1,000 year prophesied rule of the Messiah, the, a new chosen people to compete with the people that were already chosen, and the Holocaust to stop the, the prophetic fulfillment, break the word of God, and continue the age of empire. But since that failed, then we went to phase two, and that begins in 1947, after World War II. So it's no longer about preventing the creation of Israel. It's, it's, it's about destroying it now that it has been created. Okay, we need to connect a few dots here, though, because this is all leading up to you know, the second coming of Christ, the end of days, yeah. uh, the uh, messianic kingdom that will, you know, a thousand years. How does the Holocaust, how does the Third Reich, Hitler, the Nazis, their final solution, and the Holocaust murdering six million plus Jews, how does that in any way forestall the second coming of Christ? Uh, because the prophetic vision of the prophets of Israel has have left for us, a paints a picture that one day on the stage of history, um, uh, the Jewish people will return to this land, Jerusalem will become again part of the commonwealth of Israel, and then all nations will gather against Jerusalem, even this uh, final world leader will enter and claim Jerusalem. And it is when we see these events on the stage of history that the Messiah will then enter the stage of history. Essentially, the first world war, um, removed the land from the hand of the Ottomans. The Second World War gave birth to the uh, State of Israel. The Third World War is the second coming of Jesus. That's kind of how the Bible sees it. And so if Israel is not in the land, then these prophecies can't be fulfilled. Right. And then, those and things, sorry to interrupt, Ali, but those things, you mentioned the First World War, the Belfort Declaration, 1917, 50 years later, these things are happening on Jubilees. That's true. There's a Jubilee connection. Yeah. Um, with Jerusalem being given back in 1967, 50 years later, and then Donald Trump recognizing in 2017 that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Um, there's definitely, you know, Jubilee is the year where inheritance is returned. Uh, perhaps on one of these Jubilees we can accept the, or we can expect the Lord. So the idea of Satan is to break scripture. Basically, you know, if they, if they, they don't come back, the land, the nation doesn't form, Jerusalem doesn't become, again, part of the Jewish commonwealth and a, and a place of contention and ultimately the focus will be on the temple mount that is the most precious piece of real estate on this planet it is from there that the lord is going to rule the nations it is a very important maybe even energy point and so the, that's where the focus is ultimately going to be um, in order to stop all of this from happening break scripture so that the empires of the world can continue to rule under you know the influence of these beings so that is kind of uh, the, the reason why uh, there was the Holocaust to, to uh, bring in the 1,000-year the Reich, God forbid, rather than the 1,000-year rule of the Jewish Messiah. Um, so that's kind of, uh, that was the purpose of that, but that failed. In fact, that became the very reason why Israel was born. And I think it's worth reading this uh, one-line prophecy before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth at once? 
for as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. So there was this idea of, you know, can a land be born one day? Can a nation be brought forth at once? These are rhetorical questions in the Bible. Of course, the answer is yes, God can do such things. And so the November United Nations Declaration overnight created a nation. In 1948, when the mandate was over and they handed the uh, land from Britain to um, Israel, overnight an independence was acquired. So we see that this prophecy was fulfilled at the time where these signs appeared in the heavens. 2,000 years later. Uh, 2,000 years later from what? From the prophecy. It was fulfilled. Yeah, yeah. this prophecy was written 2,700 2, years ago. Ah, 2,700 years ago. Yeah, yeah. It's from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 66, which is a prophetic chapter. And you know what's interesting? In the writings of Josephus, the Jewish historian, who documented the fall of Jerusalem, he says that all of these chariots, heavenly chariots, appeared over the city of Jerusalem uh, during the Roman War, and everyone was talking about it as a sign that was given. And I think perhaps some of the people uh, who are familiar with the scriptures were hoping uh, that this verse was coming true. For behold, the Lord will come in fire and in his chariots, like the whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with the flames of fire. There's a prophetic verse that says, for behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury. So this, uh, this idea that these signs appeared over Jerusalem 2000 years ago, perhaps they might have taken hope that this is the angels armies come to repel the uh, Roman forces, but that was not the case. It was a time of judgment. So, but in the future, we can hope to see the fulfillment of this prophecy, which is just a few verses down from, from the verses that mention the birth of Israel. And that's where we're headed. So the UFO phenomenon is the beginning of, of, of the manifestation more concretely of the War of Angels. Um, and, and that's why it suddenly appeared at this time where the prophetic puzzle is coming together and the reemergence of hybrids, as strange and crazy as it may sound, ties into a pattern that takes us to the Goliaths or, or Og and Sion, the kings uh, that were in the Holy Land, uh, uh, Gilgamesh, uh, King Minos, uh, all of these creatures that we thought were mythology, like, like Hercules, um, these champions of old. Uh, the, suddenly, the modern day UFO phenomenon and the creation of modern day hybrids documented by Ivy League professors, brings all of these biblical tales out of the realm of myth into history. So in 47, it's the beginning of, well, as it was in the days of Noah, or if you go back to Genesis uh, 6, and of course the, the uh, fallen angels who uh, arrive at Mount Hermon uh, and then take the daughters of men, either by marriage or by force, and um, their offspring, of course, are... The, uh, the Nephilim, the giants, the men of renown. All right, we will uh, take another time out. Ali Siadatan Siadita stays with us. Think Again Productions, UFOs, Angels, and Gods is the documentary. You can see it for free. And uh, we'll come back and again discuss the connection between the modern-day UFO phenomenon, 75 years on, and its prophetic importance and its connection to the end of days and the arrival of the second or the second uh, coming of Christ. Uh, back with more of our conversation in just a few moments. Don't go away. My trusted sponsor, Get the Tea, is having a sale this month on their Apple Cider Plus and one package of their Life Change Tea. What a great combination, considering it's that time of the year to be laying out on the beach or beside a pool in a few less clothes, right? Apple Cider not only helps your digestion along with the tea, but it helps your tummy to feel full to help us cut down on our intake. And don't we all need some of that? Go to GetTheTea.com to grab that sale this month. I love their tea. It's an absolute priority for me each and every day. This tea keeps my digestion and gut running smoothly. Just brew, steep, refrigerate, and drink. It's that easy. Iced tea and apple cider plus for the summer. Great combination. Go to getthetea.com. Apply code Richard July to get free shipping. That's getthetea.com and enter the code Richard July for free shipping.
Guys, we've seen so many people making ridiculous money from crypto, but did you know it's easy for you to do the same? The Copy My Crypto membership site shows you the coins that the YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy him. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest as you simply do what he does. So let me tell you more about James. He runs the Crypto with James YouTube channel, which despite heavy censorship, has over 17,000 subscribers and 1 million views. Since March 2020, he's told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. Had you put in $100 into each one, it would now be worth over $53,000. Of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year, a coin called Phantom, is currently up over 440 times from when he said to buy. That one call alone has retired a number of people, including guys in their 20s and 30s. Remember, this is public knowledge. You can go to YouTube and verify this for yourself. So, if you'd like to join the 1,300 members who copy James, then stop what you're doing and head over to copymycrypto.com forward slash dollar. Copymycrypto.com forward slash dollar. That's D-O-L-L-A-R. You'll not only find proof of everything I've said, but listeners get full access for just one dollar. You can't find this offer anywhere else, but act fast because the offer ends soon. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash dollar. That's D-O-L-L-A-R. Don't take this offer lightly. He's the real deal. Go visit the site now. Welcome back, Welcome back to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. We're back with Ali Siadatan, Think Again Productions. And again, thinkagainproductions.com, the website. Scroll down to the bottom and uh, you can click on Donate and help Ali out for all of his uh, great work and his research. And you get to watch the documentary for free. So uh, all donations are certainly welcome. Think Again Productions. Dot com. Uh, can we talk about angels in the Bible? Yes. So the angels in the Bible, um, they are very different from the way that we culturally have come to know about angels. We've come to know about angels from the paintings, basically, of Renaissance masters who just took human beings and stuck feather wings on them or created for us little cherubs. And this, uh, you know, funny vision is carried through cinema. And that's how we kind of understand angels. But actually, in the Bible, angels are, first of all, terrific beings. Often prophets like Daniel and John, they faint at the presence of angels. Their presence involves metal, like bronze and things like that. Um, and um, they're physical beings, like the ones that eat with Abraham or the angel who removes the tomb of Christ and sits on it. And we are to understand that. And what's even more interesting for our conversation is that they travel in what the Bible calls vehicles. And I'll read you one verse from uh, the book of Psalms. The chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is, na is now is in the sanctuary. So the chariots of God, what's that in Hebrew? Well, it's Rechev Elohim. And the word Rechev means something you ride. That's what it means. Like when they created the uh, modern trains in Israel, they didn't have a word for it, so they had to go and look in the Bible and find a word, and that's the word they used for train, rikvat. It just means a series of these things you write, stuck together, wagons. So it means, now the reason it was translated as chariot instead of vehicle, because that's what it really means, is because until to the modern era, there was nothing else, no other vehicle but a chariot. So the translator was like, okay, let's call it chariot. And Elijah is taken up in a chariot of fire, um, uh, and the word esh means fire, rechev esh, but you know, what comes from fire is light, and horses of fire, chariot of fire, horse of fire, and a lot of times when you look at the authentic videos of modern day UFO phenomena, you literally see orbs of light, so you know, the fire emanates light, and so perhaps what I, uh, Elijah saw was also a light emanating, you know, heavenly craft that took the prophet Elijah up into the heavens and the word um, here that is translated for us as Elohim can also mean angels and so this is this is the chariot of angels and there's thousands of them at Sinai and God is in the midst of them and, and Elijah is taken up in one Enoch is taken up and the Lord is 
you know, enters this cloud, and yes, it is the presence of God, the glory, but we also see him prophetically in the book of Daniel arrive to the ancient of days, to God in a cloud. Why would we have to be carried? What is this thing that he rides there? You know, when we think of UFOs, we kind of immediately superimpose 20th century human technology. We don't really know what the inside looks like, but now we're understanding that the Bible actually talks about something and we are seeing these things around us. And that's why I'm saying this is the empirical evidence of the angelic reality. Right. And these, the, again, our, our romantic um, idea of, of angels, as you say, cupids and, and winged uh, creatures that are maybe somewhat ethereal or they're more spirit than physical. No, they are spirits, but they're also physical. These are two categories. Right. The spirits right, are they, called Shidim. But but they 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 traveled in craft vehicles. They weren't flying around. They weren't just appearing. They're not omniscient. They need to get from point A to point B, and they used. Can I call them physical vehicles? Uh, yeah, you can because they're physical beings. Now we we only know what we see because the first and second heavens are shadows of the third heaven. Once these things leave the earth, we don't know where they go and how they get there. Maybe like Einstein, you know, theorized E equals MC2, that if you took something and you propelled it at the, uh, at the speed of light squared, it would turn into energy. And so we don't know, you know, how is it that they go where they go? Uh, these are all mysteries and we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. So far, what we, are, what we know is, wow, you know, these things are around us and they're also mentioned in the Bible. So now they kind of make the, the stories of these things in the Bible less mythological. And now the Bible in turn identifies who they are, what's going on. Um, and there's a story, you know, we talked about the flood, but then what happened after the flood, there's okay. a story that connects these beings all the way to the 20th century. All right, we'll take another time out. We'll get to that story when we come back. At least you had Think Again Productions. Our conversation continues right after these. If you're living with diabetes and using insulin, you know the pain of pricking your fingers over and over again. Ouch! Well, by wearing a small remote device called a Continuous Glucose Monitor, or CGM, you can reduce the pain of pricking your fingers. If you administer insulin three or more times per day or use an insulin pump, call now and learn how a CGM can help you. Painless. No more pricking my finger. No finger pricks. Convenience. They delivered it free and they took care of all the paperwork. You can reduce pain right away. Plus, it's accurate, easy to use, and helps you spend more time in range. And if you have insurance, you can get a new CGM at little or no out-of-pocket cost. Call now and get free shipping of your new CGM. Plus, we'll bill your insurance for you. 800-817-2974. 800-817-2974. 800-817-2974. That's 800-817-2974. The truth will set you free, 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 but first, it will really tick you off. Welcome back to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Alice Yadatan, documentary filmmaker, research, biblical prophecy expert. We're talking about the connection between the modern day UFO phenomenon and the end of days, the connection between the, the pilots of these vehicles, these unidentified flying objects, and the angels of the Bible, and the prophetic significance of the modern-day UFO phenomenon and its connection to the second coming of Christ. So um, getting back to uh, the angels in the Bible, um, I guess we've sort of, we've talked about why we think why we don't think of angels in this way because it's just kind of a cultural thing, right? That that we think of angels from the Renaissance paintings and so forth. We think of them as omniscient. Uh, we think of them as more spirit than flesh and bone. Um, yeah. the, the whole idea of, a, of, of the spiritualization of angels um, goes perhaps back to the um, Hellenization of uh, Christianity, which was originally 
a Hebrew faith. Um, in, the, in the Bible, angels slay Assyrians, um, and uh, they sit on you know, the tomb. The book of Hebrews says you, you should entertain strangers, you know, because some have be hospitable, because some have met angels unawares by being hospitable. And so once we kind of spiritualized the Bible, meaning that we turned all the characters of the Bible into non-physical beings, because in the school of Gnosticism, it was believed that the highest form of spirituality is non-physical. So even though Jesus came back from the dead and he said, look at me, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spirit, I have flesh and bone, touch me. He said, I have flesh and bone. Um, and then he asked for food. So the most spiritual character of the Bible, the resurrected Christ, the resurrected Messiah, is a physical being. Um, yet, once he ascends, the early on the church begins to imagine him as though he became a spirit. But there's already a spirit version of God, which is called the Holy Spirit. He's the son of King David, and that's why he inherits the throne of David and rules. It, He's not done with the physical world. That's why he, he, he resurrected in right. the physical world. Right. If angels weren't flesh and bone, if they weren't physical, they couldn't have procreated with, with women. That's true. And, and, and then some people feel, oh, these angels you know, took that shape, or they, they just kind of for a moment you know, become human as though it's so easy just to take on like this clothing. Like, like, so the church begins to imagine how to marry its spiritualized concept and the physical reality of angels in the Bible in the biblical text. And it comes up with a solution that for a moment they take human form. That's not in the Bible. That's just an idea. It's a gap idea, you know. But if you stick with the Bible, they, they are presented as physical beings. Job has his daughters, uh, not Job, uh, sorry, um, Lot has his daughters um, and... Um, and his wife in the city of Sodom. And when they come to, the angels come to warn him of the destruction of Sodom, the men of Sodom seek to have sexual relations with them because Sodom was a place where such things were happening. That's why it was destroyed. It, it was a place where, you know, the sexual relations with the angels was happening. So it's, I know it's very strange some of the conversations we're having, but just to pull out the nature of the, of the angelic world and the nature of the universe is very different than the cultural notion of it in the Bible. We are in the heavens and on the earth. We're not in the universe in the secular scientific way of thinking about it. There are three heavens. The universe is the second heaven. The earth is, is the earth, but the sky is the first heaven. And the temple at the heart of time and space is the third heaven. And these a heavenly craft, that's what David Flynn used to call them. He was a researcher who passed away, but a really good researcher. He used to call it heavenly craft. They, they come and go in these heavenly crafts between the realms. And, and what shape they have outside of the one we know, we don't know. But the fallen angels are, are also, uh, you know, referred to as having bodies of light. And I think that the angels also have bodies of light. That's why the Lord transfigured to show the next prototype of where we're headed. But they still uh, have substance. They're part of the created order. They have to follow the rules of, of, of God's creation like us. They're not above it. They're not creatures of magic. Like in the book of Enoch, the angels, the fallen angels, the sons of God, they give knowledge that we would essentially call science today. You know, pharmakeia, uh, the building of armament, um, all kinds of the, the understanding of the motion of the moon, like astronomy, astrophysics. These are the fact that we are able to cut the atom and decipher DNA and send rockets into the heavens is because we are of the world of God and angels and we are naturally trafficking in the same kind of high-end knowledge that they have. Is there a, a physical difference between, let's say, a good angel and a fallen angel? Can you tell them apart? Uh, it says we are told to test every spirit. Um, it's, you know, I can only... Physical I can, difference between, let's say, sorry. <laughs> Siri was uh, talking to me there. Sorry about that. Funny. Um, the, the, you know, Siri's mostly listening, but sometimes talks as well. But the, the thing is, often we see these characters presented in a reptilian form, like in ancient art. We see the fallen angels cre presented with like snake legs and bodies. 
And when we look at the modern day abduction phenomenon, we, we have these characters that have very long foreheads and black eyes, and they're very tall. They're still anthropomorphic. They have two legs and two hands, and we were made in the image of God. And, and perhaps, you know, the, the world of angels is, is kind of anthropomorphic, but um, they are called Lizardians, these, these guys, these, uh, these tall characters. So, so maybe, maybe the fallen angels don't exactly look human like we do. The, right. I mean, they were just, they were just, they were angels who rebelled, right? They were cast out. So why would they necessarily look any different than, in, than, than any of the other angels? Well, you know, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Satan's called the dragon. Um, is, is that because that is actually giving us insight? You know, he's also compared, uh, called the serpent. The word Nahash uh, in, in the book of Genesis means serpent, but also means shining one. Um, because, you know, these guys are luminous. And so, um, and it's interesting how um, the research converges. Everyone, you know, I, these are, this is all the things I discovered between 1996 and 2001. And I've seen people literally repeat the same ideas about what these words mean. So I really think God is kind of bringing people to the same conclusions. Um, and we're understanding the reality of these things. Yet, there is a huge amount of mystery. So we don't want to kind of think that we're nailing it and we figure it all out. While we're figuring out is, okay, this phenomenon that just appeared over our heads, God is opening a veil and, and opening, increasing knowledge and saying, look, in the Bible, this is the nature of the angelic reality. They do come and go. I come with them. Um, you know, there's the word Rekev for angels, but God has a Merkeva. That is, that is something God writes. And Ezekiel gets a vision of it. He sees one. He sees what God writes and has a kind of a crystal, uh, you know, plateau. On it, there's a throne that God sits on. And underneath this plateau, there are four angels that are called cherubim. And they're very elaborate beings. I mean, they're, they're, they're incredibly glorious beings. Their facial structure is elaborate. The number of wings they have are elaborate, but these are not bird-like wings. They put them up, and when they move them, when they put them down, when they sit, and next to each one of these angels, there's two wheels intertwined with each other, one that moves left and right, the one, that, one that moves east-west, one that moves north-south, so that that's how the wheels are. Okay, i got to jump in here. Pardon the interruption. Uh, we're approaching the top of the hour. Hour two with Ali Siadatan awaits. We'll continue uh, discussing the connection between the modern day UFO phenomenon and the second coming, the end of days, biblical prophecy. Don't go away. If you're a fan of this radio program and the Strange Planet podcast, why not show it off by wearing Strange Planet apparel or drinking from a Strange Planet mug? Check out all the great Strange Planet merch in my Strange Planet shop. Just go to the website, strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca, and click on Shop in the menu. There's a huge selection of men's and women's t-shirts. You like crop circles or the Mayan calendar? Got you covered. Are you into the Anunnaki? Wait till you see these designs. My favorite right now, lions do not lose sleep over the opinions of sheep. And one of our best sellers right now, Truth Gets You Crucified on the front and a passage from Matthew chapter 23 on the back. So many great t-shirt designs, I don't know where to begin. There's women's leggings and tote bags and of course, mugs. Great gifts for family and friends who listen and love this show. My Strange Planet shop. Visit today and often. Just go to strangeplanet.ca and check it out. Have you subscribed to my newsletter yet? It's fast easy and absolutely free just go to my website strangeplanet.ca strangeplanet.ca and then click on subscribe all i need is your email address and that's it then once a month you'll receive my newsletter inner sanctum in your email inbox the inner sanctum contains a monthly brief a column of my analysis of the news and opinions there's a this month in ufo or conspiracy history a look ahead to an upcoming episode of this radio program, a book club, my podcast pick of the month, a spotlight on a previous guest, and much more. Join the Strange Planet community by signing up for your free subscription to Inner Sanctum. Again, go to strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca, and click on subscribe.
It's a strange planet. Read all about it. Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Following the truth wherever it leads. Exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites. Revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality. Coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard. Thanks for inviting me into your home, your long haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' well appointed basement with the simulated wood paneling, electric fireplace, and the painting of dogs playing poker, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. Carlos Cagina is our technical producer. Ryan White is the live stream producer. And please, if you haven't already done so, pl please uh, check out my YouTube and Rumble channels, Strange Planet. The website, incidentally, is also strangeplanet.ca. Documentary filmmaker Ali Siadatan stays with us. Think Again Productions. And uh, the documentary UFOs, Angels, and Gods, thinkagainproductions.com, the uh, website. Also, if um, you'd like to help uh, Ali out and uh, donate uh, for all of his fine efforts and his work, you can go to his Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash think again. Patreon.com forward slash think again. And there's also uh, kind of an audio, audio book, if you will, a chapter by chapter analysis of uh, the book of Revelation. All right, Ali, uh, thanks again for joining us as we uh, head on into hour two. Now, uh, we're talking about the, um, again, the connection between the modern day UFO phenomenon and its prophetic significance uh, from a, a, a Christian perspective and the modern day UFOs, uh, uh, modern day UFOs phenomenon, the modern day UFO phenomenons. Um, a connection to uh, biblical end of days and the second coming of, of Christ. We were talking just towards the tail end of hour one uh, about Ezekiel's vision. Yes. We're all, we're all familiar with Ezekiel's wheel. Yes. Uh, and he's describing one of these, these vehicles, these crafts, right? And you were describing the vehicle that God himself rides. Yes. Yes, right. So in... In the book of Psalms, we hear about the Rechev Elohim, which is, the, I believe, the vehicle of the angels. But in Isaiah 66, when it says, For behold, the Lord will come in fire, and in his chariots, another word is used. It comes from the same word, uh, root word, to ride, but the word here is Merkeva. And so, you know, one of the Israeli tanks is called Merkeva because it actually kind of means carriage, you know, something that carries you. And we see that it's even put on the decoration of the temple. David, you know, tells Solomon, you know, put the Merkava on, on the decoration of the temple, the mercy seat. And Ezekiel has a vision of it. So we actually get a glimpse of what this looks like. Um, and it has this crystal um, field thrown on it, these four magnificent beings underneath it. And next to them, there's two wheels intertwined into each other. And the wheels are made of crystal as well. And then God commands the angels, the angels command the wheels, and they can turn in any direction, and then they carry him. So God's throne is actually a moving throne. Um, this, this presence of God comes over the Lord and takes him up, this white cloud that he ascends to, because they see him in the book of Acts, and takes him to the throne um, uh, at the temple of the heart of time and space, the throne of God. Something carries the son of David, who's also the son of God, but also the son of King David. As, he, as I said, he was resurrected in flesh and bone, carries him there. And, and, and so the angels have their own, God has his own, and, and they're going to come back in this way. And there's, there's going to be a heavenly army coming. What exactly are these things that they ride? How do they operate? We don't know, and we don't want to kind of project human technology into it. We just want to acknowledge that the Bible presents this. And... What, one of the huge discoveries that I made was was that um, the term, uh, the name of God, Elohim, uh, one of the names of God, applied also to the gods of the nations. And 
Once I realized that, that this was the chariot of Elohim, Recha Elohim, I realized, oh, okay, so, the, so God and his angels ride this, and the fallen angels have these things too. They all have it. It is, it is, it is a hallmark of the angelic world, not just of the fallen angels. So this is this 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 term of this vehicle is associated with the whole, you know, the, the whole host of them, and, and and so this became for me the empirical evidence of the presence of God and angels in our world. The UFOs are in fact angels in our world, and yeah. because the good angels, let's call them, they have vehicles. The fallen angels have vehicles. This yeah. would also perhaps explain. Uh, why some people have very um, uplifting, let's say, encounters with the, the so-called ETs, uh, and, and others have torturous, hellish experiences. Well, yeah, well, we do have to be careful. Uh, John says in his, one of his writings that we should test every spirit that comes to us. Um, and uh, even the book of Revelation begins with this massive identification of who's talking to John. You know, the first chapter of the book of Revelation is who, all kinds of identifying uh, terms from John's, you know, Old Testament tradition. So, so this idea of testing who's talking to you, I would say the majority of the modern day UFO phenomenon is the fallen angels. But as a whole, you know, take zooming out, this thing is is associated with the world of angels as a whole, even God in the midst of them, you know, has in Merkava, we'll see the throne that moves. Um, so, you know, I mean, look at the Lord, he, he was um, on, on the fishing boats of the Sea of Galilee, he was at the end of Roman whips, he was on the back of a donkey, and that's fine with people, but you put him in the heavens, and in the midst of his angels, in these vehicles and suddenly it's like you've downgraded him or something <laughs> uh, well no this is even this is even more sophisticated than the donkey which was the most sophisticated thing that he wrote on the earth so so this is not a downgrade this is just an expansion of our understanding that this generation needs because of where this is headed okay let's talk about when we're talking about fallen angels now let's talk about the gods of the ancient world order yes who were the gods after the flood, um, the, this, what happened after the flood? After the flood, what happened was that the nations that were divided and, and they suddenly began to worship these beings. And that is what urbanization is. Urbanization, anthropologists say that in the south of Mesopotamia, suddenly there was a change in the way humanity was, was organized from clans and patriarchies to um, adherence to a royal priest who was a shepherd of the gods. That is how the first cities of the world were born, city-states. There was a, it was a change in the way humans organized their society. What happened? Well, in the south of Mesopotamia, we see suddenly the birth of civilization. And when we look into the, sac into the texts, some of them sacred, some of them historical, that are, we found, we carted out from the libraries of Mesopotamia, it talks about how knowledge was given to them by these beings, the gods. And that is the story of the birth of all the civilizations, whether it's Moses going up on a hill, Muhammad receiving recitation, the Avesta of the Zoroastrians, the birth of, of the Hindu culture um, and with the v appearance of the Vedic texts, uh, the, the cradle of civilization in Mesopotamia. Suddenly there was this knowledge download. And it's like, well, what does the Bible say about these beings called the gods? And when I looked that up, in 2001, 2000, 2001, that period, I, I had a program called ESORT, and I, I could put a word in and uh, isolate any word in the Bible, and I looked up the word gods, and I realized that there was close to a thousand passages uh, that talked about this. Actually, you know, here, I can... <laughs> Where'd you I go? Can... There he is. <laughs> I'm here, sorry about that. And I actually printed out these passages, and... I still have them as I think I kept them as a souvenir. This was the printout of, of all these passages that talked about, about these beings. And as, as I started to, to read them, I sat down and read all of them. And I realized that, first of all, the same term that was used for one of the names and titles of God, Elohim, was used 
to talk about these beings that are over the nations and that God was presented in, 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 in connection to them. He was called the God of gods. Um, and, and I thought, well, how could God be the God of mythological beings? And it would say, no, the Lord is the God of gods. And I started to look into the Hebrew and I realized the word Lord was Yahweh. And it said that Yahweh was the El of the Elohim, the God of gods, and the Adon of the Adonim, the Lord of lords. And so suddenly there, I, I, I began to see that these creatures that were over the nations, the Bible treated them as real. God judged them, like in the story of Exodus, the gods of Egypt are judged. He admonished them to worship him, you know, worship him, all ye gods. Um, and sometimes he named them, like the Queen of Heaven, Tammuzi, Shemesh. Um, Armaduke. And spoke, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and spoke to them, about them in name. Um, and once you sit down and read all the, and also he was presented in conjunction with them. He was their leader as well. He was the God of gods. Um, in Psalm 82, uh, it said, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. And it's interesting because, you know, I, I realized there was, the word Elohim was used in both cases. God, as in Elohim, stands in the congregation of the mighty and he judges among the Elohim. So the same term, uh, Elohim can mean the God of Israel, but also the gods of these nations. Um, in the Hebrew thinking, the word Elohim means uh, God as the ruler of authorities. And so God is the ruler of all the authority systems in the creation. But there is also these other beings who are of authority and power. And that's why that name is referred to them as well. It can even refer to elders of a tribe or even the head of a family. These are all authority systems, but they all kind of answer to the one authority. And as I was meditating on this massive revelation that the gods of the nations were actually the fallen angels and now was taking seriously all of these accounts from Mesopotamia, uh, especially from Mesopotamia, but because that was the root of it, but also Egypt and Persia, India and China and Mesoamerica, that there was massive knowledge download that created our world. That we and were the, the Greek pantheon. The Greek pantheon. Oh God, Zeus and uh, Athena and Poseidon, these are not actual these are not mythological figures these are fallen angels they were real they well were, yeah they were worshipped as gods they were worshipped as gods and i was thinking to myself you know and i'm just giving really the short version this was a massive study I, I i did into all of these beings and all these verses in the bible uh, once i uh, the you know the whole thing appeared in my head i thought wow well, is there a verse that connects them all and there's a gentleman that had a relationship with chuck missler who's also in the documentary, I attended private Bible studies with him, and uh, you know we, we had a relationship. And, and Chuck used to say, when he talked about the sons of God and the story of the ancient giants, he would say, there was one more place where the sons of God is mentioned, That's, but you have to look it up in the Septuagint, not in the Bible as we know it. You have to look it up in this old Bible uh, that, that was the Greek translation of the Old Testament about 300 years before the time of Christ. And, and Ptolemy, the Greek uh, leader of Egypt, asked, uh, he noticed that the laws of all the gods existed in the library of Alexandria, such as, you know, the court of Hammurabi who was given down by Shams, the sun god and all that, but not the laws of the God of Israel. So he asked that it be translated. And, and so Chuck used to say, if you look into the Septuagint, you'll see that in the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, verse eight and nine, it says, um, that when God divided the nations and, and gave them um, their boundaries, um, he did it according to a number of the sons of God, and Jacob he chose as, an, as his own inheritance, uh, instead of what it says in all of our Bibles, which is that the nations were divided according to a number of the sons of Israel. And then Chuck would say this, and he would just move on as, hey, there's another place where the term sons of God is mentioned. But with my discovery of the relationship of these beings and the nations, suddenly this term, this sen this verse meant a lot. So I quickly ran to my computer as this idea came to me at in the conclusion of this research and I put it in and it was right there in the Septuagint. It did say that. And now I could see that the Bible was saying at the foundation of history, there was a spiritual division. The nations were given into the hands of the fallen angels who now I understood presented themselves as gods 
as idols, as objects of worship, and God chose Jacob for himself. And the same with the God. In other words, Israel. God. God said, Israel is mine. I will rule over Israel. The rest of you fallen angels, have at it. That's right. And, and so in 2006, when we kind of released the documentary, um, I, I walked into a magazine store and suddenly I saw this copy of biblical archaeology that I bought. And in it, there was, you know, the, the altar of, uh, of Zeus, which this uh, uh, person identified as Satan's throne, which was what we had identified in our documentary. In fact, the understanding of the relationship between Zeus and Satan was the key that God used to catapult our mind into this entire research of the relationship between the gods. And so I was like, wow, this is interesting. So I, I took it and I went home and I read it. It was an interview with Adela Collins, a Yale professor. And then suddenly in there, she says, when the Most High gave each nation its heritage, declares Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, when he divided the all kingdom. Slow down all, a little bit. You're, you're really, you're okay. raised alley. That's okay. Um, <laughs> when he divided all mankind, he laid down the boundaries for peoples according to the sons of Israel. A Dead Sea Scroll fragment containing this verse, however, has the phrase sons of God instead of sons of Israel. The Dead Sea Scroll fragment apparently retains a more original form of the text. The Septuagint, uh, the third century translation before the time of Christ um, uh, of the Hebrew Bible into Greek also has the sons of God. The early church father, Justin Martyr, who apparently used the text that preserved sons of God, believed that these sons of God were angels to whom God entrusted the care of human beings. Um, and, and Justin Martyr also believed based on Genesis 6, and it goes on. But the point is that, you know, she made a connection uh, between the sons of God um, and the nations and quoting Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, 9. And what I learned from Adela Collins in 2006 was that not only did the Septuagint record this version um, uh, of reality, but so did the oldest known Hebrew copies of the book of Deuteronomy, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this was a huge confirmation. I felt like a peace suddenly as though God had just brought this magazine to confirm both the altar, and you have to watch the documentary to learn about that, um, of Zeus and its relationship to Satan, and how that had become a gateway into this research that led to this understanding. So now I had a bridge to the modern day UFO phenomenon from the days of the flood. What happened after the flood was that these the nations were given to the hands of these beings and they downloaded they continued to give information the way that the sons of god gave knowledge to humanity before the days of the flood and corrupted the world through that knowledge that continued into the world after the flood in fact that's why the early christians were killed uh because they were no longer sacrificing to the gods who were who were seen as the backbone of spirit of power spiritual power behind the emperors and so so the empire you know was being weakened and and this uh change of world order um came after uh the resurrection of christ when he went to the father and sent the holy spirit the passover lamb who would free the children of israel from the gods of egypt that same passover lamb began to, to free people everywhere from bondage to these beings it's as though satan had a legal right because he says to christ that dominion over all the kingdoms has been given to him and he will give it to whomever he will and so he had a legal right over the nations in the blood of christ there was this purchasing of humanity and whoever kind of pledges allegiance to to him is removed from this legal obligation and brought into the kingdom in the same you know place jacob was and when i looked into the story of the gods i realized they had flying craft like you know everyone has heard about you know the the story of von donakin you know the chariot of the gods that von donakin wrote and the whole ancient astronaut theorists that talk about all of these i don't adhere to that perspective but i appreciate some of the research and so i realized that wow these beings had been with us for a long time over the nations. I mean, that's why there was sightings over the Sea of Jerusalem when the Romans laid siege. That's why there's been sightings over the ages. And coming in the 20th century, looking at the modern day UFO phenomenon, there was the beginnings 
of an attempt to reinvent their identity, which was laying the foundations for a coming deception. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, we're going to take another time out here. When we come back, we'll uh, continue along. So um, where to go next? I guess we'll just, maybe we can talk about... How it comes together now, the convergence of how the deception, now that we've identified who these guys are, let's talk about the propaganda that's released into the world that the saviors of mankind are here and the Nephilim kings of the earth that are coming and the connection they will have with this whole phenomenon okay. and in order to lay the foundation of the deception. That's why the UFO phenomenon is being ramped up in the news lately. Because right. we'll, we'll do after that. COVID, we've come to a new place in the apocalypse. All right. Back with more of my conversation. Ali C. Adetan, Think Again Productions. Stay with us. I call it the miracle molecule, carbon 60 or C60 for my good friends at C60Evo.com. And I take a tablespoon every morning. It delivers more than 172 times the power of vitamin C. C60 is a known antiviral, antioxidant, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory. It's a remedy that works. C60 Evo users consistently enjoy better sleep and wake up feeling refreshed. This alone is worth the cost of the bottle. I sleep like a baby. I have no aches or pains. Zero. I'm 58 and I don't have a gray hair on my head. Get your miracle in a bottle. C60 from c60evo.com slash richard hyphen serrett. c60evo.com slash richard hyphen serrett. Use the coupon code EVRS at checkout and save an additional 10%. This statement has not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. If you have a medical concern, please contact your healthcare provider. You can become an official Patreon supporter of my work here at Strange Planet Productions by donating a monthly amount through patreon.com forward slash strange planet, patreon.com forward slash strange planet. There are several tiers to choose from. Pick which one is right for you, but any monthly amount is greatly appreciated. As a sign of my appreciation, you can have your name mentioned on air during my weekly radio show, or you could have your name included in a crawl on my YouTube channel live stream. You could also receive episodes of my old podcast, The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. This critically acclaimed podcast, produced in partnership with Chris Jericho, is not currently available anywhere else. If you enjoy this podcast or my weekly radio program, The Conspiracy Show, you can really get behind me and my work by donating once a month at patreon.com forward slash strange planet, patreon.com forward slash strange planet. It's time to redefine reality. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Ali Siadatan, Think Again Productions, thinkagainproductions.com. And if you'd like to support Ali's work, you can go to patreon.com forward slash think again. Patreon.com forward slash think again. So let's, uh, let's bring it up to the modern day uh, era. And again, we're in the midst of this modern day UFO phenomenon, which began 75 years ago. And there have been a number of important developments in the world of ufology, if you will, or disclosure. And, um, uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, just the other day, the uh, James Webb Telescope released these new images uh, of deep, deep space, allowing us to peer deeper into the universe than ever before and almost back in time the universe is a, what about 13.8 billion years old and and uh, this these images supposedly can take us back almost you know 12.8 or 13 billion years ago so not quite back to what they call the big bang the beginning uh and 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 allowing us to glimpse the atmosphere of exoplanets. And so have people, again, once again, speculating about, is this where we look for life, intelligent yeah, yeah. life on other planets and so forth? So again, the whole, you know, and then we have uh, 2017, the New York Times article about this secret UFO study group deep inside the Pentagon and expectations, again, building, building towards some kind of disclosure announcement that we are not alone and, and so forth. So connect that, this 
disclosure right. movement of modern day times to prophecy. Yeah, so how do we see all this? Once I understood that the UFO presence was an ancient presence, and that, that we are, we humans, are of the world of God and angels, and therefore our history is the result of the interaction of the world of God and angels, that, that the, the, the fallen angels have given knowledge to all the nations, that's how civilization was born, all of these bodies of knowledge that are the basis of our culture were actually the basis of Mesopotamia, architecture, mathematics, astronomy, military arts, uh, kings, priests, religious laws, the laws of the gods, all of these things. And the story of Israel, which, which begins the story uh, of redemption, you know, with the character of Abraham. And so this, this is the history of humanity and the coming of the Holy Spirit and the altering of the nature of the spiritual landscape from polytheism to monotheism. When, when you kind of come in the 20th century, the Bible tells us that there will be a, God will allow the fallen angels to have one final empire. There's going to be a final empire. We haven't, we're not used to empires, you know, we, there was a Roman empire that kind of broke into pieces uh, and became the various, you know, empires of Europe. There's going to be a final empire and Israel comes into the land and is going to contend with this final empire and it's going to have a leader. This is kind of where the prophetic, you know, points. And now these things that have been here for a long time make a massive reappearance, but they're not just making a reappearance, they're rebranding. When you look at the messaging of the UFO phenomenon early on, very early on, like in 1948, you know, I have a book that talks about this, this scientific advisory board that told the uh, uh, American government in 1949 uh, that these guys are here to sell, save us, to rescue us, to help us um, enter into the galactic community and put away our, our nuclear, uh, our atomic, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, put away that stuff and put away our violent ways. They're here to help us. And then you, you see, you know, I put this, this poster in the documentary when I was talking about this, I put a poster of a movie called The Day uh, the Earth Stood Still because that was the first piece of Hollywood propaganda that I found that echoed this message as to why is it that aliens have arrived, which in that movie, this alien has arrived and then he uh, puts the entire planet into a minute of silence and shuts down all technology and declares, once he has everyone's attention, the message, which is put away your warlock ways and enter the galactic community peacefully and we were stronger than you. So how could have we known so early on in the research of UFOs uh, in the late 40s and early 50s when this stuff even started, these UFO flaps, these mass appearances and stuff, how could have we ever known what they were intention, what their intentions were. We we're just like seeing lights in the sky. So this is this is a plant. Someone is planting a seed in our in our minds. And I have now seen how this idea has basically taken over the UFO world, which is very popular. Tons of people secretly believe that the saviors of the world have arrived. Right. We often hear from abductees in quotes, that once they're aboard the craft, they're, they're shown movies about Earth's future and, and we're in peril. And often the, the, this narrative involves climate change uh, right. and things like that and, and, and ec uh, environmental degradation. And they are here, as you say, to to enlighten us, to further our spiritual development so that we can learn to live in harmony with the earth and with nature and, and to, uh, to save, to save the planet from uh, Gaia, really. It's, it's, uh, it's Gaia, right? The earth is mother earth and it's very pagan sounding. Yeah. The, that was the second phase of, of the messaging. Uh, at first it was about nuclear war and then it became about the environment and, um, but like what you're saying, they're telling them there's going to be environmental disasters and we're here to help you. There's a very famous case that uh, Dr. Johnny Mack from Harvard University, head of psychiatry, investigated. I think it was a private school in Zambia in Africa. Mm. And there, I, there's a video you can watch on YouTube. He's talking to a little child 
who had they see these aliens, you know, appear in the courtyard. This they, was, you know, I think, it was in, yeah, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. They, yeah, hundreds of school children saw them. Yes, and the, and she, you know, she's describing how he had these big black eyes, just like like many other abductees describe the same thing. And then Doctor uh, Johnny Mackey says to her, "So, what, what, what did you think?" And she she said. As I was looking into his eyes, the idea came to me that we should save the planet, we should save the environment. And then he says, well, did you have this idea before? And she says, no, like it came from him basically. So there's this messaging. You look at Dr. Stephen uh, Greer, who I met uh, um, a long time ago, but he didn't want to be interviewed. Uh, he's not interested in a biblical perspective, but he says that these guys are gonna give us gifts as technology to help with the environment. They're gonna give us ways to turn salt water into drinking water very cheap and things like that. And so there's this environment that becomes an issue. And we've seen once I, you know, when I researched this, like in the, in the beginning, uh, you know, around 1998 to 2000, when I started to see that this is what was the messaging, I decided to keep an, an eye on what would happen to the politics of the environment, because in those days, the environment, you know, there was this greenhouse effect story, but it wasn't really so big as it is today. And in the past, you know, 20 years, I watched how the environment became more and more a political hot issue until it v virtually has become the number one political issue. It's become a religion. It's become a religion. And we, I think, should expect that it's going to be a next COVID-like event, that, you know, there's going to be environmental things, and these guys are going to come and say, we'll, we're going to, I don't, you know, some will see who says it, but there'll be representatives that tell us they're gonna help us. And these guys are telling the abductees, we will help you when these things happen. Now in the Bible, there's there it does talk about the judgments of God, like the sun, it says it's gonna become very hot and burn people. And that's in uh, Revelation chapter 16. So is it that, that, that God is playing with, you know, the astrophysics of the planet and these guys are twisting it around uh, to make it look like it's, you know, carbon creation and all of these stories. But definitely, again, they're positioning themselves as the saviors of the human race in light of some great disastrous idea. But that's the big message. And the saviors of the earth have arrived and they're no longer the gods of the ancient world. That's how they presented themselves to their to our ancestors. They're rebranding as modern day gods or aliens. And, um, um, it's, it's, it's important to understand where the idea of aliens came from. Um, when you go back- Are there real aliens, by the way? I mean, I mean- Yeah, that's a good question. Gods, or we talk about angels, but does that necessarily know. mean that there are no other, there, there are no extraterrestrials out there? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Basically, um, it comes down to worldview. Um, starting with Galileo and Isaac Newton, all these guys, we they start to, change the nature of reality in our thinking we're no longer in the heavens and on the earth and this these beings are no longer the host of the heavens and we the host of the earth these guys start to tell us that we're in the universe and we're like what's the universe they're like well i don't know we're going to have to discover what it is we'll decide for ourselves what it is so it's a bunch of gases and rocks and here's a telescope you can peer into it like you were mentioning with the james webb telescope and it's like, okay, so gradually we started to have a different view of reality. And a lot of these guys, you know, Galileo and Newton, I respect their research, but they're also Masons. And the, the, the nature of reality altered. Then Darwin comes and he provides kind of the creation myth of the atheist. And, and people then begin to project Darwin's theories into this secular scientific concept of the universe. And they go, well, if we were, you know, evolved here, these beings evolved elsewhere and they're visiting the earth. So we start to create a fairy tale to explain the modern day UFO phenomenon. And the reason our worldview has been set up leading to the 20th century is because these guys can now rebrand themselves as aliens into this secular worldview they've created for us. But if we're not in the universe in, the, in that sense, we're actually in the heavens. And even if our history is born of the interaction of our culture and the world of God and angels, then if there are beings in these other planets, they are also part of the kingdom of God. They have a relationship with the presence of God and angels in it. Okay, I got to jump in here. I got to take a quick time out. We'll come back 
Ali Siadatan stays with us. Think Again Productions. In times of economic uncertainty and chaos, your money means nothing. You may not even be able to get it from your bank or ATM. And the money you do have in the stock market will go down and down. What you can bank on is gold and silver. Gold and silver have been a reliable and trusted form of currency for thousands of years. Gold and silver have never been worth zero, and typically gold holds its value during economic turmoil. Call the gold hotline now and learn how to protect your money and your assets with gold and silver. And learn how to set up a new IRA or roll over your current one into a gold-backed IRA. Protect your money from the next market crash with gold and silver. Call now for your free gold guide. 800-461-9694. 800-461-9694. 800-461-9694. That's 800-461-9694. Do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Are you being audited or investigated? Has the IRS sent you a letter demanding payment? You may not owe what they claim. Make this free call to the tax doctor now. Let them negotiate with the IRS on your behalf. 800-626-4512. 800-626-4512. 800-626-4512. That's 800-626-4512. If you're a diabetic, we have great news. You can end the painful finger sticks with a new CGM. Plus, they may be covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance. If you test and inject daily, you may qualify. Call U.S. Med now to learn more. 800-817-2974. 800-817-2974. 800-817-2974. That's 800-817-2974. As you're staring up at the night sky, ever wonder who's staring back? You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Ali Siadatan, Think Again Productions. Okay, we've got some ground to cover here. I want to jump ahead. Um to the rise of the modern day hybrids, which is, I guess, kind of wrapped up with the alien abduction phenomenon, so-called, which mirrors the, uh, you know, Genesis 6. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, the, the Genesis 6 said that it would happen then and afterwards, the creation of these hybrids. And so what's interesting is that Daniel chapter 2, very important, one of the most important chapters of, of the Bible, I mean, not that every chapter in the Bible is important from my point of view, but Daniel chapter 2 gives us kind of a blueprint map of the world's imperial system until the Messianic kingdom established by God. And it tells us that at the end of days, there's going to be 10 kings. There are going to be a coalition of 10 kings. And it tells us that these 10 kings are born of the commingling of seats, that they shall mingle their seed with the seed of man, and it's the plural masculine pronoun, the they. So it's something other than man that's going to mingle their seeds with the seed of man. And then it, the next verse talks about the rise of these ten kings, and then it says it's in the days of these kings that God will establish a kingdom. And these ten kings are going to have a leader. And this leader is referred to as the seed of the serpent. It's one of the names that he has. And, and there's a, this is a continuation of, of this phenomenon that goes back to the Genesis 6. Now, Jesus talked about the parable of wheat and tares, that God planted his seed in the garden, and while he was sleeping, whatever that means, maybe it was the Sabbath, I don't know, the devil came and planted his seed in the garden. So the earth was seeded with life, then, then the life was seeded with knowledge, and that's how civilization began. But some of this knowledge was perversion of God's creation. The seeds that the enemy planted were not just ideas to pervert reality, like these laws and teachings that were brought into the world to go against the teachings of God, but it may have actually been real literal seed. They had hybrid offsprings, and these hybrid offsprings became kings, like Gilgamesh, Minos um, from the island of Crete, uh, Sihon and Og, two Nephilim kings mentioned in the very Bible, warriors such as Goliath, uh, but there are also other warriors mentioned outside of the Bible, like Hercules, Achilles, etc. 
So, so this phenomenon is coming back. Some of it is the ancient bloodlines. Some of it is the modern day uh, creation of hybrids. But there's going to be a, rule, a leadership over us once again from these guys. And at the helm of it, there's going to be this man who is called the Seed of Serpent. And he's going to do lying signs and wonders, miracles essentially, and make fire come from the sky. He's going to speak against God and the hosts of the heavens. It says that in the book of Daniel, we're not used to world leader. So this, this is where is this all going? There's going to be a final empire. But this empire is very different from all the empires before in, the, in this overt connection to, to the supernatural. And it seems that the rebranding of the fallen angels as, as these, you know, uh, modern day aliens is, is maybe comes out of the kind of the cloak of secrecy. And that's why we're seeing all this disclosure. They're kind of getting the culture ready. Years ago, I read a CIA report that had done a psychoanalysis of the culture that it would be too dangerous to tell people they're aliens here. It would just create chaos. So there has been this kind of grizzling of information in order to protect prepare the culture, which already believes in the presence of these beings in mass. I mean, people come up to me all the time because I'm a researcher and confide that, that they do believe the saviors of humanity are here, but this is the great lie and it's already kind of started over the culture. We're going to see the rise of a Nephilim kingdom. We're going to see the rise of, of one who is the leader of them all. And he is going to, you know, make these lying signs and wonders to what end well we know that his empire will last for seven years and at the end of it when the lord and his angels enter history during this prophetic war centered around the city of jerusalem it says that the world in many places in the bible in the book of joel in the book of revelation in the book of zachariah it says that the the nations will gather against what we would call the second coming of God. And it sounds crazy. Why would the nations go to war against God? I mean, not believing in God, rebelling against God, fine, but going to war against God. Well, of all the lies and deceptions that began in the Garden of Eden with a conversation between Satan and Eve and, and, and the altering of the nature of reality by creating these thought veils, the Bible says there's going to be a final act of deception. Okay, that will be gonna... a great lie. We're going to hold it right there. We're going to get to the final uh, act of deception when we come back with Ali C. Adetan, thinkagainproductions.com. Stay with us. If you're living with diabetes and using insulin, you know the pain of pricking your fingers over and over again. Ouch! Well, by wearing a small remote device called a continuous glucose monitor, or CGM, you can reduce the pain of pricking your fingers. If you administer insulin three or more times per day or use an insulin pump, call now and learn how a CGM can help you. Painless. No more pricking my finger. No finger pricks. Convenience. They delivered it free and they took care of all the paperwork. You can reduce pain right away. Plus, it's accurate, easy to use, and helps you spend more time in range. And if you have insurance, you can get a new CGM at little or no out-of-pocket cost. Call now and get free shipping of your new CGM. Plus, we'll bill your insurance for you. 800-817-2974. 800-817-2974. That's 800-817-2974. The truth will set you free. Free, free, free. But first, it will really tick you off. Welcome back to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. All right, let's get to the, the final deception again. Now the world uh, being ruled by a coalition of these 10 Nephilim kings. Uh, at the head of them is the the uh, the serpent seed the antichrist yes and and this is happening to us by the way because we are of the world of god and angels and i just want to say that when you look at the story of the bible the prophets of israel they paint a beautiful picture of humanity's future uh full of hope uh an incredible redeemed earth basically jesus ushers in a utopia but the book of daniel tells us of the age of empires and the collision it you know uh, uh, of, of the prophetic dream of the prophets of israel and this final empire 
and it culminates in a cosmic battle. Now that we're seeing that God is preparing us for the true nature of how this is going to go down, that the Lord and his angels will come in these things they ride, um, and th these fallen angels have already started to prepare the culture for a rebranding of themselves, and then they're going to take this rebranding. This is a conjecture, but this is, a, this is something many people uh, are thinking about. They're going to then rebrand the Lord and his angels also as an invading alien force. And they're going to kind of reverse reality, which is something they've been doing for a long time, which is they're going to present him as the one who gave us religion, who's, who wants to be worshipped, who's bad. And from the beginning, like the Masons, you know, they say, oh, Lucifer was the good guy. He wanted to give us knowledge. And God kind of, the, the Hebrew God kind of prevented it. This is this, the continuation of the same line of thinking that the ones that are here and their hybrid civilization, which it's just like they're, they're, they're tapping into the ones that were made in the image of God and creating beings in their own image. They're trying to replace this resurrected, uh, you know, uh, priesthood, which is going to be part of the kingdom of God. They're trying to create their own version of it. You know, they're, 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 they, they have their own leader. They have a, a race in, in the image of the, of the fallen angels. And they want to kind of, create that empire here and carry it into the heavens. So they're going to rebrand the Lord. They're going to rebrand him as an invading alien force. It's going to be like a good cop, bad cop scenario. And, and, and they're going to present themselves as the good cops and the Lord is the bad cop. They're going to reverse reality. And this is how they're going to deceive and lie the nation, to the nations and behind this king of the king of the nations. Because the Psalm 2 says, why do the nations gather against God and against his Messiah? Um, and so this is kind of, you know, the, what's going to happen. There's, there, the nations are going to have a king of the king of the nations. And he's going to gather the nations with this deception against the second coming of the Lord. And now we have the battle of Armageddon, a cosmic war. This is where the UFO phenomenon is headed. But to understand it, you have to kind of unravel the puzzle from the beginning and put all the pieces together and then it comes together in this way this becomes a biblical perspective of this increasing heartbeat of disclosure that we're seeing it's headed to a final deception that rallies the world against the second coming of jesus christ this is a possibility a very real possibility now so the people that are promoting ufo disclosure um are they just useful idiots that, that, that don't understand? Are they maybe not useful? Uh, idiots is strong. Useful fools. They're not fools. They're actually, you know, uh, if you don't have the salesmen Holy for the Antichrist. I mean, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, your, your mind and heart are open to deception. So you kind of catch a wind uh, of whatever the culture is throwing at you. And so a lot of the guys that are into this phenomenon are just not into God. And so they are being already deceived by this great angelic, you know, propaganda. It's very powerful. They, they reach into people's mind. There's energy. There's ideas being thrown out. And then some of the, perhaps some of the top guys, you know, who is it that's in contact with them and worships them already? I mean, you look at, for instance, Lord Bacon, you know, the, the great Mason he was allowed to see these creatures they call them in masonry the unknowable ones and these these creatures of light that appear to the top masons and so maybe some of these top guys have some sort of communication but but most of the people get deceived because their heart is not in the right place you have to be sealed by the holy spirit and then you have god's perspective flowing through your consciousness and the scriptures open to you so it's very important now more than ever to make one's peace with the King of Kings because we're entering into the transition of history from the Age of Empire to the Messianic Kingdom. Um, there's going to be a great unveiling of, all, of, 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 of the Lord and his angels and the world of these things is colliding with the human world. That's why it's seeping through in the form of the UFO phenomenon. It's already upon us. As I said at the beginning, a sign in the heavens was given in 1947 when a sign on the earth appeared of the reborn nation of Israel, because this is telling us we have entered this age of history. We're, we're basically in the beginning of the birth pang years in 1947. 
And now we're seeing since COVID an acceleration in this, you know, if we're to use the imagery of a woman giving birth, that um, the, it gets, uh, the contractions get closer and closer as you get, so as this age of history is about to give birth to the next one, the contractions are going to intensify. And so we're headed in an accelerated way into these deceptions. And if you don't really have this preparation from scripture, it's going to be hard to put it all together and, and not to be deceived. So it's, you need the Holy Spirit. If people want to know more about this, I do recommend that they listen to the series on, on the book of Revelation and on a Patreon account. They can go on my Think Again Productions dot com and sign up for the newsletter go to youtube and sign up for the youtube there's videos coming in and you know i serve the community uh that's supporting me and uh keep people uh, in the loop as to uh, what the bible says about all of these mysteries patreon.com forward slash think again patreon.com forward slash think again and also think again productions dot com and um always a a great pleasure, Ali. Uh, just very quickly, the the audio um, is like an audio book of your analysis of every chapter of Revelation. Yes, 22 chapters. There's one chapter uploaded per week starting tomorrow when people get the first chapter, and you'll get a chapter per week, and you get to listen to it. It's, it's not always verse by verse, but it's pretty close because the book of Revelation is very rich and you know if you went verse by verse you could just talk for hours but much of what's in every chapter is pointed out and from this point of view that the apocalypse is basically mainly the war of fallen angels and their hybrid offsprings and their kingdom against the second coming of god that's really what it is god is kind of you know we talked about the days of Noah, but also the days of exodus where god comes and frees his people from the yoke of the Pharaoh and of his gods. That through what? Through the Passover lamb. And that is also eschatological. It's talking about the end of days. When the Lord comes and frees us, delivers us from the Antichrist, who is like the Pharaoh and the spiritual forces that are behind him, like the gods of Egypt. You know, we are the benefactors. This is a rescue mission. This is the final redemption, the good news. So the, God is in control. We shouldn't be afraid. God is in charge completely, even of, of the devil and of his angels. And, and the kingdom of God is, is, is winning and is sovereign. This is just a moment in history where this conflict happens. So God is going to remove it. This is a beautiful time to be alive as we enter into the next age of history, into a utopia. That's what the Bible says. All right. Ali, thank you again. Thinkagainproductions.com. All the best, my friend. Thank you very much for having me, Richard. My thanks to Carlos Cagina and Ryan White. I'll be back next week with a brand new program. Hope you'll be along for the ride. And uh, in the meantime, don't be afraid. There's nothing concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper. Proclaim from the housetops. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. Good night. A new Richard Serrett's Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Subscribe at strangeplanetpodcast.com.